Hi everyone, this lesson is on a parasite that can increase the risk of bladder cancer. And what is that parasite, you might be wondering? That parasite is known as Schistosoma hematobium. This, along with some other similar species, can cause a condition known as Schistosomiasis, but we're going to focus on Schistosoma hematobium because this is the one that's going to increase risk of bladder cancer. And the other species of Schistosoma have different shapes, but the Schistosoma hematobium species can be recognized by a what we call terminal spine. So a spine on one end as opposed to a lateral spine, which we can see in other species known as Schistosoma japonicum. So these Schistosoma parasites are parasitic flatworms or trematodes. They're also known as blood flukes. This particular species, Schistosoma hematobium is going to be found in African countries, mostly sub-Saharan Africa, and also in the Middle East. And overall, it's estimated that over 200 million people are affected with schistosomiasis, and up to 700 million people are at risk. And a lot of these infections, especially with schistosoma hematobium, which is going to be the topic of this lesson, can occur in very young infants even, in children. This can be their first exposure to this parasite, even at ages of 2 to 5. And we can get exposed via contaminated water. We'll talk about this here more in a moment. So how do individuals get infected with Schistosoma hematobium? So it's all going to start off with exposure to a water source that's contaminated with these par parasites. So either through contaminated drinking water or via actually entering into a water source that contains these parasites, we're going to get at first what we call free swimming cercarii. This is the independent parasite. It's independent of a host and Originally, this parasite would have come from a snail. So cercarii are going to come from a snail. They swim through the water. And if a person enters into that water source and there's any exposed skin, then that cercarii can then swim toward and penetrate their skin. Once it enters into the skin, that cercarii can become what we call a schistosomule. And that schistosomule will then enter into the circulation. It'll enter into the bloodstream. Then those schistosomulae will migrate to blood vessels in and around the bladder and intestines and mature into adults. So some of the other species will have a predilection for entering into blood vessels around the intestines, around the liver. Schistosoma hematobium will have a predilection for entering into blood vessels around the bladder. This is why we're going to see this increased risk of bladder cancer. We'll talk about that later. So it's going to enter into those blood vessels, mature into adults, and those adults are going to start to reproduce and make eggs. And again, with regards to Schistosoma hematobium, the eggs are going to be released in urine. So that's going to be a key here as well. So what happens when a patient becomes infected? So first, it's important to point out here that patients can be asymptomatic, meaning they have no symptoms at all. So this can be quite common as many patients may have infections with these parasites and not have symptoms. A lot of times though, at first, when they first get infected, they can have an acute infection. They call it a swimmer's itch. So when those cercarii penetrate into the skin, wherever they do penetrate into the skin, that can cause little bumps or little itchy spots on the skin, what we then call a swimmer's itch. So there can be an itchy rash. This is going to be a temporary thing. So all schistosoma species will cause a swimmer's rash. Some will end up leading to gastrointestinal symptoms. Some will end up causing a condition known as Katayama fever. But with regards to schistosoma hematobium, it's going to lead to urogenital schistosomiasis. And with regards to urogenital schistosomiasis, we're going to get a genital urinary infection. So it's going to be a genital urinary infection. We're going to see signs and symptoms involving the bladder and also even into the male and female reproductive system. So some of the symptoms can include hematuria. Hematuria is blood in the urine. And what's key with regards to hematuria in a urogenital schistosomiasis infection is that oftentimes the patient will perhaps not have urine that contains blood at first, but once they finish urinating, then there will be some blood at the end of urination. This is what we call terminal hematuria. So this is a key specific finding with regards to urogenital schistosomiasis. This can be either painless or painful, and it depends on oftentimes how long a patient has had this infection. Some other symptoms can include lower urinary tract symptoms. These include dysuria or burning sensation when urinating, urinary frequency, which is frequently needing to urinate. So you go and urinate more frequently just because of that irritation in the bladder and also 
we can see urinary urgency or a feeling of urgently needing to urinate. We can also see a pelvic pain or lower abdominal pain in patients. And then if in male patients, some of the male reproductive organs can be affected. So there can be epididymitis and inflammation of the epididymis. There can be something called hematospermia. There can be blood in the sperm. In females, there can be an increased risk for infertility. And there may also be what we call dyspareunia or pain during intercourse. And there can also be an increased risk of HIV infection with chronic infection. So this can be a particular infection that can increase your risk for HIV. And more specifically, how does this particular parasite affect the bladder and increase the risk for bladder cancer? So again, schistosoma hematobium is going to reside in the venous plexus around the bladder. So it's going to be in the veins around the bladder. So that's where the adults are located. And then those adults are going to release eggs into the bladder. So all of the releasing of eggs in the bladder are going to lead to inflammation in the bladder. So this is going to be key. Now, over time, there's going to be inflammation, there's going to be some damage, there's going to be tissue damage in the bladder. This can lead to ulcerations, so there can be ulcers in the bladder. This can eventually lead to polyps in the bladder, and then there can also be calcifications after long-term inflammation. So you can see in this image here, there's some calcification. All of this inflammation, prolonged inflammation especially, so chronic inflammation, can increase the risk of bladder cancer. So what kind of bladder cancer can this cause? So the type of bladder cancer is going to be specifically known as squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder. This is actually going to be the most common type of bladder cancer in non-Western countries. In Western countries, it's going to be urothelial carcinoma. And what's going to often be the case is that generally it will take decades. So if a patient has an infection, a lot of times, again, we talked about the fact that they can be asymptomatic. They may have had some symptoms in the past, but they don't have much else, or they do have symptoms, but they don't deal with them or they don't treat them. Then over time, having that chronic infection, having that chronic inflammation can increase the risk of squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder. It's often, again, going to take at least 10 years. It's often going to be 20 to 30 years. We talked about some cases where kids can become infected. So kids, especially if they haven't been treated for decades, they can be at a risk for bladder cancer or anybody that hasn't been treated. Having other risk factors can also increase your risk. It just simply adds more risk on top of the inflammation that's already being caused by these parasites. So if you're smoking, for instance, smoking is a big risk factor for bladder cancer. So if you're smoking on top of having this particular parasitic infection, you're increasing risk even more. But if it's only about the parasite, how many patients will end up getting bladder cancer? It does seem to be about 1% of patients who have a chronic infection will get bladder cancer. These are the numbers we have. There's not a lot of data on this, but this is the number we do have. So you may be thinking, well, maybe this isn't a lot, but if there are hundreds of millions of people that are infected with schistosoma hematobium, or at least millions, we can see many thousands of people getting squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder with infections. So that's going to be important as well. Now, how is this particular condition diagnosed? So urinalysis, urine microscopy can help with the diagnosis. This can help in diagnosing. The best time to collect urine is going to be midday between 12 to 3 p.m. This is when there is most shedding of these particular eggs. So that's when most eggs are being released, about midday. PCR can also be used to make the diagnosis as well. And serology testing, this will help to see whether or not a patient has had a previous infection at the very least. Now, what is the treatment for schistosomiasis or schistosoma hematobium infections. Prazoquantil is going to be the treatment. It's going to be an oral treatment. We can either do it 40 milligrams per kilogram one dose or 20 milligrams per kilogram three times a day in four to six hour intervals. So a total of three doses with four to six hour intervals. So that would be the treatment. So if we treat this, especially treating it early as opposed to waiting decades, is going to help reduce the risk of bladder cancer. Please check my full lesson on schistosomiasis if you want more information on other species and some of the signs and symptoms that they cause. Please also consider joining as member for members only content. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.